We are live now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we're all gathered here today to felicitate Professor C.T. Korean on his 90th birthday and mark the many contributions he has made to the field of economics. This event is organized by the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, a charitable trust established in 2003. The foundation's major objectives are to facilitate and sponsor multidisciplinary, theoretical and empirical inquiry in the field of agrarian studies in India and elsewhere in less developed countries. I now request Professor Vikia to carry the proceedings of the event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Nira. And thank you all for joining this tribute to Professor C.T. Kurian, one of our greatest economists and teachers in economics. Professor Kurian was on the faculty as a lecturer and then as a professor of economics at the Madras Christian College from 1953 to 1978. He was uh, he was edu sorry, he was educated in in Madras Christian College and uh, St. Joseph's St. Joseph's Bangalore, but he uh, he he finished he did his PhD while on the faculty in Madras Christ uh, Christian College at uh, at Stanford. He also worked for a. Uh, he was a visiting fellow at Yale during the MCC years. After 1978, he was one of the co-founders, uh, the first director and one of the co-founders of the Madras Institute of Development Studies. And in one way or the other, he was his professor and head of the institution. And in different ways, he was associated with the uh, with MIDS until 2003. Professor Kurian, uh, who has written 15 books on theoretical and applied economics, is an, is an economist, of course, with, of enormous distinction. He was a, a national fellow of the University Grants Commission, a national fellow of the Indian Council of Social Science Research. He was president of the Indian Economics Association, and he received the University Grants Commission's uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in 1996. Uh, CTK is, of course, an economist of great social conscience, committed to using the discipline of economics to transform conditions of hunger and poverty among the people of India. I am uh, particularly privileged to to chair and to to moderate uh, to chair this discussion. And uh, actually, I've got quite a claim. To, I've got a claim. On this, I was I, I CTK. I think I'm the only person who's actually been uh, an undergraduate student, an MA student, and a PhD student under you. Would that be correct, CTK? I'm probably the only uh, probably the only one. And uh, I, you were also my he was also my first boss. He was the director of the Madras uh, Institute of Development Studies when I joined as a junior faculty member. The my first experience with CTK as a teacher and economist was when I joined MCC, where CTK taught an extraordinary course, extraordinary because of CTK, because he made it so, called Indian Economic Problems. I shall not, I joined this course, he taught us this course from 1969 through 1972. I shall not, of course, try to summarize what have been described as, as the churning processes of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Suffice it to say that uh, for a student entering university at the time, for a young student entering university at the time, and I was, uh, when I, I was 16, when I started CTK's course, it was his teaching and course was one, an important means of trying to make sense of the inequity and injustice that characterized India's economic problems. Uh, I was fortunate to have studied economics at a time when it was seen as part of the study of economics was seen as a part of the whole task of nation of nation building before the days of uh, before the uh, neoliberal takeover and before the plague of postmodernism. 
CTKs uh, had come into the social sciences. CTK's lectures were detailed, they were data filled, and uh, with clear analytical considerations. In fact, CTK, the two terms which would, were used uh, very frequently in his, in, his, uh, in his presentations were descriptive analysis and analytical description. These were how he, uh, you know, he, he sort of would characterize many of the many of the explorations he made into the Indian economy. He taught us our basics. I mean, it was a time when the public sector was seen as, as both a sector where the state intervened because to build an independent economy where the private sector and the corporate sector would not go. It was also seen as a countervailing force in the economy. If it was agriculture, he taught us, again, the basics that, uh, that the problems of agriculture were, uh, were land reform, were productivity, the application of science and technology, the problems of equity and incomes for the poor. So in each, in each sort of category, in each subject, in each field of the Indian economy, CTG gave us, gave us well, for, for lack of another word, give us a line. He gave us the line. He gave us a, a line of progress, of, uh, of shall we say, a pro-people line. Uh, CTG was also a great partisan in class. I mean, it, it was not just a, you know analysis. And he would, for instance, after the after uh, I remember him teaching us. Uh, after teaching, finishing our lectures on land reform, sort of, he said, so here are the arguments, but we finished the lectures and he'd look very fiercely at the class and say, so is anyone who says that we shouldn't have land reform? And uh, you could be sure that uh, no one could quite muster up the guts to say that uh, there was any disagreement at all. But CTK made, sort of committed us to positions in class. I, I'm, I don't want to exceed my 10 minutes, but uh, we have together, we have brought together today, a group of people who worked with, were either his students in MCC or worked with him there, or worked with him in, uh, in MIDS as faculty or as colleagues, or who worked with him uh, in, in different capacities during his, his long career. CT, uh, let me end by saying that CTK used to ask us that, uh, so what do you think is the, the main problem of the Indian economy? This was one of his questions. And you can be sure that CTK did not un answer it in the way it's often answered today, that you know, too many subsidies, problem, problems of balance of payments. For CTK, the ma major problem of the Indian economy was always that hundreds of millions of our brothers and sisters lived in poverty, in avoidable poverty and hunger. And, uh, you know, at the time we took that class, none of us thought that 50 years later, when that, when that question is posed before a classroom of students today, it's still the same answer. The, uh, what is the major problem of the Indian economy today? It is, the, it is that, um, hundreds of millions of our brothers and sisters live in abject poverty, in hunger, in, a, in conditions of avoidable disease, in, uh, with very little schooling, and in conditions of class caste and uh, different kinds of gender oppression. That, but the fight goes on, and CTK is one of those who have helped us fight it. The, uh, before we go on, before I, uh, I ask each of you to speak, the, I'm going to request all of you, as Nihira already has, to speak for five to seven minutes each, so that we can, uh, so that we have time for everyone. Uh, before that, I would like to re read a, read out a short message of greetings to this uh, gathering. I, re I I begin. I am extremely privileged for having been invited to send a message for the seminar organized on the occasion of the 90th birthday of Professor C.T. Kurian, 
eminent economist. Apart from being an erudite scholar, Professor Kurian has also been a columnist on social and economic affairs. He has been a consistent supporter of policies which benefit the vast majority of people. The dominant stream of economics has not only eluded the understanding of many non-professionals, but has also been a convenient tool in the hands of policymakers, uh, of those policymakers who believe in the philosophy of restricting the role of the state. The question of, of distribution or growth for whom does not occupy a pride of place in the minds of such policymakers. It is here that economists like Professor Kurian have made the difference by taking up the cause of economic policy for the people. He was an early advocate of a scheme of an employment guarantee scheme uh, like MMGNREGS, the demand led work providing scheme, which the government announced after the rural, after rural distress attained large proportions, even in the midst of impressive economic growth numbers. Today, the world is slowly re realizing that the philosophy, economic philosophy, that there is no alternative to the rollback of the role of the state is not an unrebuttable pro proposition. The pandemic has exposed, exposed the fragility in states which rolled, them, which rolled back from social sectors, even though they, they may be high per capita income states. Kerala has been in the forefront of searching for alternatives and making on public intervention in education and health and decentralized democratic governance. The economists and social scientists who believe in these alternative models are working with us, and many of them draw inspiration from scholars like Professor Kurian. On this occasion, I convey my best wishes to Professor Kurian on his 90th birthday and wish the program a success in highlighting people-friendly policies. Gunarai Vijayan. So, so that uh, uh, Chief Minister, of course, Chief Minister of Government of Kerala. So, so City Gabe, welcome to this program. Welcome, Mrs. Kurian, to this program. And uh, and happy birthday. What about? <laughs> yeah. And. And happy see. birthday, I said. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> and happy birthday. I said that early in the morning, actually. I said that early in the morning. So, and happy birthday. Uh, welcome also to. Mrs. Kurian, Mrs. Susie Kurian, to Prema and Priya, if you are here, to John, to Roshan, to Kofi, and to Vas. Thank you. We should begin this program with uh, uh, our senior economist and uh, CTKs who worked with CTK as early as 1975, I believe. Emeritus Professor of the, uh, oh, I mean, much more than that, of the Indian, of the Institute for Development Studies, Kolkata, Professor Omiyo Kumar Bhakti. Professor Bhakti. You'll have to unmute yourself. No, Omiyo, you'll have to unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Omiyo. Neera, can you help him? Neera, please unmute. I have requested him to unmute. Did you unmute for him? No. No, I can't remotely unmute. You can mute, but you can't unmute the host. Ah. Am I audible now? Yes. yes. Uh, let me first thank the Foundation of Agrarian Studies for inviting me to this wonderful program in the in honor of, of one of our leading public intellectuals, is a chief Kurian. Uh, and particularly, V.K. Uh, Ramachandran, because he is instrumental in organizing this program. I have known Professor Kurian since 1975, when we were both uh, part of an ICSSR delegation to Moscow. And there, something very interesting happened. At that time, 
the Russian line on Indian development was that it was non-capitalist development. And there we were, all the delegates from India, practically without any exception, me, Nirmal Chandra, Nish Raja, Professor Kurian, saying, no, India is treating the capitalist path with all its attendant uh, problems, including growing inequality, growing poverty at one end and riches at another end. Professor Kurian has been a pioneer in the study of regional developing problems. The study of 1974 on the economy of uh, Tamil Nadu, economy and society of Tamil Nadu between 1960 and 1970 were pioneering effort. He then followed it up with another study in 1995, where he studied the dynamics of the uh, Tamil Nadu economy from, I believe, in 1960 to 1980 or 1990. He has also been one of the uh, first persons to critique the Goribi Hota plan of Indira Gandhi. In 1974, he wrote in the Economic and Political Weekly an article saying that growth as such does not lead to the reduction of poverty. You have to see what kind of structure the economic program has. If, if it has to be a, a, a poor oriented program, First of all, this must be directed towards generating employment, and it must be directed in such a way that it is, it is the gains are distributed equally. And that means that the there must be a stress on the production of goods for the poor. Professor Kurian has all the you know all the books that he has written that I have seen. Uh, Ram has already been said that he has written at least 15 books. In all of these books, he has stressed that economic development means nothing if it does not lead to human development in its broadest sense. It must have the components of uh, healthcare for everybody, education for everybody, and food security. And there, the role of the state is the critical. Professor Kurian has never deviated from the idea that most of us had during the 1960s and 70s. Most of us who were lucky enough to be born after, uh, to be in find independence in my our own lifetime, that it is necessary for the Indians to live as equal citizens, and the equality must start with economic inequality, equality. Uh, without economic equality, you cannot have social inequality. But this social equality also, I mean, for real uh, progress, you must have social equality within classes, within castes, within religions, and so on. He has never deviated from this program, which is uh, certified by his latest book of in 2012, one which, in which he talked about justice. The uh, policy intervention must always be directed towards the addressing the issues of justice in society. And Professor Kurian has not only been a leading academic espousing these causes, but he has also written copiously in journals academic journals in newspapers advocating what he is doing. And unlike uh, some of us, he has actually been involved in policy making at various levels. I will not uh, extend my talk anymore. There are many people who know Professor Kurian much more intimately. All I can say is that I use Professor Kurian uh, uh, a very productive life still. I'm sure his mind is still taking over just as it has done all his life. And wishing him a happy birthday today and happier and happier birthdays to look forward to in the future. 
and thank you again for inviting me to this. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, uh, we're now going to have Professor Mizushima Tukasa. He will speak, for, he's speaking to us from, uh, from, it's getting late for him uh, in Tokyo. Uh, uh, Professor Mizushima, in my, was probably the first uh, international PhD student at, uh, working at MIDS. Yes. When I, when I first, <laughs> the, fir the first of the international PhD students. He went on to, uh, he went on to succeed his uh, PhD advisor. He was uh, Professor Karashima's first PhD student. He went on to succeed his uh, PhD supervisor as the professor, as professor at Tokyo University. He's now retired and uh, very active. He's now writing a book on Madras president, presidency in the, in the 19th century and covering the fam famines of the 1870s. Professor Mizushima. Uh, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, congratulations for your 90th birthday. Actually, uh, when I first met you, I was only in my late twenties, and I gave a talk at MIDS. And at the end of the uh, of my seminar, you very warmly encouraged me to continue the study on Tamil Nadu. For that, I'm very very grateful. Thank you very much, and I'm really happy to meet you today. Uh, uh, can I talk something about what I'm doing? Uh, I'm working at the moment. Is it okay? Uh, uh, I can't you're hear muted. you. You're muted. Yeah. You are muted. Uh, Ramsa, I cannot hear you. Shimasan, it's fine. Please do okay. so. But okay. you have seven minutes. Seven minutes. Seven yeah. minutes. Yeah. Seven minutes. Okay. Okay. So, I, can I use? Uh, are you sharing my? Are you sharing my uh, PowerPoint? Okay. Yes, yes, please go okay. ahead. Okay. So I will talk about uh, uh, population movement since uh, uh, late 18th century, because I have been working on that from the uh, village level. And uh, I'm selecting a Qing uh, uh, Lastly, it was called the Jagel. Now, uh, different names, but uh, it is uh, one of the richest area in uh, in in India actually, uh, with uh, so many uh, detailed records from uh, uh, the late 18th century onwards, uh, because uh, it is under the right to worry system. But even before the right to worry system was in, introduced, uh, uh, the uh, British and not only the British and the, uh, there are many uh, indigenous record available in that region. So, so what I'm working on uh, at the moment is uh, uh, what, was, uh, what was the features of the population movement uh, in Chingleput. And then uh, uh, in connection uh, to that, why the great farming of the uh, late 1870s occurred and what was the features? This is what I have been working. And uh, what is I have been working in the past almost 15 years say, using many, many maps and uh, using uh, GIS, that the geographical information system. And uh, uh, so for instance, say, uh, it has uh, so many records like 1983, uh, this is a map and there are uh, so many place names here. And uh, this is nine, uh, 1793 and uh, this is 1917, and uh, this is the top map of 1954. And from these maps, uh, one by one, I picked up around uh, around one million one million place names, and I and I geo uh, coded it. Actually, the, if you look for some names in the Google Map, you have only 0 0.6 million place names. But my my system actually has uh, around 1 million. This is uh, the top of the world. <laughs> and uh, I opened it on the website. And you can easily find uh, many of the place names, hamlet names uh, in the uh, so-called India Place Finder, which I created some uh, 10, 10, 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, uh, it's, it's one of the best. Uh, and not actually, it is not the one, but it is the best uh, mm -hmm. among all the place finders. 
So then uh, I also uh, gave introduction of uh, around, I think around one, uh, 10,000 uh, uh, maps all around, uh, not only India, but also uh, Asia and uh, uh, some part of East, uh, East Asia, uh, Korea, Japan, China, Central Asia. But, and you can easily find out, uh, you can, if you use Asian map collection, then you can locate where those maps are located. And uh, you can also see in the website, uh, the, uh, the rough image of those maps. And, uh, and uh, by using these maps, I, I, I prepare this uh, India Press Finder. So if, you, if you write down some village name, it will show uh, the candidate, because they are a uh, candidate of those hamlets, because there are so many same village names in, in, in Pamuna, like, like Agraharams, maybe more than several hundreds of Agraharam in, in, in South India. But, but you can locate it uh, by, by utilizing uh, this, this system. And uh, it's very difficult uh, to identify names because the names and the spellings all changes. There is no formal way of uh, uh, for say, uh, giving alphabetic uh, uh, spellings to, to those names. So one by one, I had to identify, but, but in that way, say, uh, I could trace as the population changes because, uh, uh, for instance, this is a Bernard record of 1770s. Right? And uh, say, if we, if I can find this, uh, like uh, uh, this, this is a big name, but but Ariangal uh, Murukanjuri, then I give uh, latitude and longitude. Then you, then I can locate where it was located. In this way. Uh, uh, Many studies becomes possible, like uh, uh, inscriptional studies, like uh, Karashima did. Uh, even if you find out any uh, some place names, you cannot find where it is. But by my system, you can find it. Okay. Uh, so in such a way, and, uh, uh, I gave uh, geo codes to all the hamlets in uh, every record, and. Uh, uh, this is uh, and this is the 1790s place uh, Lionel place report. This is a uh, permanent settlement record 1801, and uh, like census 1871 until today there are names. But uh, if you see uh, the spellings, all are different. But uh, I I did many months to identify uh, whether this village is uh, same or not because. If you even if you compare the total population of one district, the boundaries all changes, administrative divisions all uh, have changed. So uh, the total number doesn't say cannot say anything. But if we can compare the uh, figures of every village, then uh, we can say something very very uh, concrete. And uh, yeah. in, by using this. I could find us. I investigated the population growth of 1801 and 1871. There's a big, big population increase, like 2.5 yeah. percent, uh, 2.5 times. This one 3.8 times. So, uh, uh, so there was a big yes. It, this is fascinating, but we'll have to slowly wind up. This is okay. fascinating. Yeah. Slowly. This is fascinating, but we'll have to wind up also. You know? Okay, okay. No, no, no. Just, just yeah. a few minutes yeah. more. Just yeah. a few minutes more. Okay. So, like, uh, so I, I, I could say that uh, the, there's a big uh, population movement, uh, population increase, as well as land development. This, this uh, compares the uh, uh, development of land. So I could say that uh, previously. It, uh, uh, the pre-census information was uh, uh, under in the black box. No one knew what happened. Actually, happened, but my study shows there was a big increase like this. But when I see a uh, uh, great farming period, some villages increase the population greatly, while others lost. So what what actually occurred? That is my uh, uh, current issue. 
And uh, for this, I have been working, say, or whether it was uh, by the over-exploitation or whether uh, it, it is related with some village structure or some transport system or farming ready work, ready works. But these features is now under investigation. But anyhow, uh, congratulations to your 90th birthday. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is that okay? I mean, did, did, I use ten min, did, did I use 10 minutes? Yeah, thank you. Yes, you did. But thank you. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll, sir, yeah. we, we will not, we will not uh, let you go that easy. We will we'll get, get you to give us a full lecture on this subject <laughs> okay, very, okay. very soon. <laughs> very okay, soon. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we now will have. Uh, one of CTK's other, another old friend of CTK, who got to know him, I, I believe, when he when he was a corresponding correspondent covering uh, campus life for the Hindu. Uh, we have uh, the eminent journalist and former editor in chief of the Hindu group of publications, N. Ram. Seven minutes, Ram. Thank you, Ramachandran. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello, Ram. We've been out of touch for a while, but I saw you chair Ijaz Ahmed's talk. He had dealt with many aspects of contemporary capitalism, but didn't even touch upon what I consider to be a critical aspect, that of financialization, which marks capitalism shift of emphasis from production to transaction. I have briefly developed it in the attached note I'd appreciate your comments. Then followed a succinct and crystal clear exposition of how this shift from production to transaction had happened, of the setting of financialization and of the questions and problems it has raised, classic quintessential CTK. And then this, at the age of 90, I can only raise these problems, but I do hope that the range of issues that I've raised will be followed up primarily for their academic significance, but also for policy implications. Warm regards, CTK. The 2000 word expository note emailed to me on May 1st, 2021, 10 days after Ijaz Ahmed's talk was written to be accessible to a layperson. But it was no surprise that as a non-economist, I had no worthwhile comments to offer on what had evidently been thought and worked through with technical competence, precision, and elegance. Instead, I marveled at this commitment to the life of the mind at age 90 or close to it. It has been a commitment to the truth insofar as it can be aimed for in a field that defies comprehensive theorizing and has many pitfalls where neoclassical theory, mainstream economics, is far removed from real life situations, notably mass poverty, exploitation, and growing inequalities, where in the author's view, a radically different approach is called for, to which he continues to make contributions by raising questions and flagging problems. There's a remarkable consistency in Professor C.T. Kurian's approach, theoretical as well as empirical to the field of economics. Some of that has been touched upon by people who are much more competent to speak about it, in particular, my friend Amio. This is not to suggest that his thinking has remained unchanged over the decades. Decades, The questions and issues he has taken up and analyzed in his books, in his distinguished body of uh, published works, speak to his range, depth, and creativity as an economist. And of course, I must leave it to others economists who are competent to speak about this, to give us some insights and cues on the significance of this large body of work. But for me, what runs like a red thri uh, thread through CTK's life and work going beyond economics is progressive pro-people thinking that brought him to his calling as a researcher and teacher of economics in the first place, which is to say during his final high school year, 1947-48, as he told Stuart Burks in a 2012 interview done for the World Economics Association, and I quote, there was a great deal of public discussion, 
indicating that since political freedom had been achieved, attention must shift to gaining economic freedom, especially for the masses under bondage of poverty. It was my hope that through a study of economics, I'd be able to understand the causes of poverty and contribute to its eradication. I cannot help recalling that a century earlier in 1845, Karl Marx had famously concluded his thesis on Feuerbach with this call to action. The philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. I do not wish to label CTK in any way, but there's, but there's clearly an ideological, emotional, and indeed political kinship between Marxist and progressive and upstanding socialist intellectuals like CTK when it comes to understanding real world exploitation, mass poverty, deprivation, inequality, and injustice, and contributing to ending this unacceptable situation. Nowhere is the intellectual dimension of this kinship more significant than in CTK's forensic, clear-cut, and robust criticism as a professional economist of neoclassical theory and mainstream economics. As he explains in the 2012 interview I cited, and I quote, after and I think this is very significant, after recognizing but deliberately setting aside objective and verifiable features of an economic system, it relies on untested and largely untestable aspects of human motivation as its basic premises. Such theory, instead of serving as an aid to real life studies, easily becomes a tool for ideological propaganda. We all have our favorite teachers, going back in many cases to our school days. My favorite teacher was Kurvila Jacob, iconic headmaster of the Madras Christian College High School in the 50s and 60s. I was not a student of CTK in any formal sense, but I've learned a lot from him over the years. For example, on the analytically significant distinction between the objective process of secularization in modern society and secularism as a guiding principle of value in the constitution. I know from friends who are his students at the Madras Christian College and at the Madras Institute of Development Studies that as a teacher of economics, CTK had few peers. He was respected, beloved, and influential in equal measure. I'm told he could be stern. Fierce was the word I heard from one of his standout and presumably favorite students, P.K. Ramachandra in our chair, when he found students showing scant interest in the subject. Few who learned at his knee at the undergraduate level are likely to forget the three, inter three related questions he maintained were needed to understand an economy. Who owns what? Who does what? And who gets what? I read about this in the 2012 interview. I wish to say a few words on CTK's well season. No. And, uh, give me a uh, yeah. couple of minutes, if I may, uh, or one, one and a half minutes. Yeah. CTK's well reasoned and conscientious positions on social and political, national and international issues going beyond economics, from opposition to the US imperialist war against Vietnam in the 1970s to the fight against communalism as a political mobilization strategy and campaigns for secular democracy and freedom of speech and expression. I can't think of a single issue on which CTK and people like me have not made a common stand over close to five decades. Finally, let me pay tribute to CTK as a friend, much my senior, but never patronizing, okay. always warm and affectionate, encouraging you to do more and better. His simplicity and integrity stand out in everything he does and has accomplished professional, intellectual, public, personal. Thank you. He and his wife, Susie Korean, were traveling in a bus. I'm pretty sure this was early in their married life. I recall hearing this at a farewell gathering at MIDS. CTK asked Susie if she could accept a life like this without luxury, but a life for the mind, an academic life that was his calling. And she readily said yes. This brings me to the wholehearted and loving support he's had from his family 
a close-knit family comprising Susie Korean, Prema Korean, Kofi Benefo, Roshan Benefo, Priya Korean, and Vas Rahman. Happy birthday, CTK, and thank you, Ramachandran, for this license. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to now uh, thank you, Ram. Uh, I'm going to now ask Professor M.A. Oman, founder professor at the uh, John Mathai Center, uh, former chair of the of the fourth finance uh, state finance commission of Kerala, honorary fellow at the Center for Development Studies, an eminent economist. To speak, Mansarboy, ah, please, Professor Oman, please switch on. Uh, Professor Oman, you're muted. Thank you. Can you listen, hear me? Yes. Yes. Now we can. Five to seven minutes, please. Ah, uh, yeah. Christy, Susie, Prema, and Priya. I feel happy and honored to participate in this important event celebrating the 90th birthday of a great colleague and friend. It is difficult, however, to compress and say something about a person with a productive and abundant life. This task is particularly arduous when you know him for over 60 years. My observations are anecdotal. City Gurian was an academic par excellence. He, he, he was not a careerist. Teaching and research were his enduring passion. A unique salience of CT is that he was clear about his worldview and value premises. If I were to borrow the words of Akesen, I would say that he had acquired the capabilities to lead the life that he had reason to cherish. Although Christy and I enter the non-Algerian milestone without much interval, I have held him an exemplar, an ideal to look up to. I have no hesitation in saying that I have learned much from him as a scholar, a human being, and as a distant friend. Belonging to the first batch of MA students of the Kerala University in the 1950s, and the first PhD of the university with no academic tradition to boast of. I was somewhat envious of C.T. Kurian at Madras Christian College at Stanford, meshing comfortably with such stalwarts like Kenneth Arrow and Holy Scenery. I have read most of his works reviewed some of them and reread a few like the economy and interpretative introduction. I was struck by his spontaneous preference for fairness and justice in whatever he wrote. No wonder I could easily share his moral universe. Karl Marx and Karl Popper long ago said that to pursue any scientific study, learning something about, no, uh, Karl Popper long ago said that to pursue any scientific study, to learn something about the riddle of the world in which we live and the riddle of man's knowledge about the world, unquote. I think Kurian went further and realized like Karl Marx and Karl Polanyi, that economics is embedded in social relations, as Enron has rightly said. Ever since I met him decades ago, till now, he was disturbed by the appalling poverty and offensive opulence. And certainly, 
never bypassed like many a Nobel Prize winner, winning economic pundit, reminiscent of the priest in the Bible who hurried past the wounded and helpless on the roadside. No wonder, despite good groundings in classical and neoclassical economics, he always was governed by the cost to the Indian realities and, and changing the dynamics of it. His distinction of the need-based economies and want-based economies was a meaningful conceptualization that could expose the emptiness of the pursuit of growth per se models. While I was appointed professor and head at the Dr. John Mathai Center of Calicut University in the mid 1970s, I thought it an opportunity to reform the economic syllabus of the university. I studied the syllabi and curricula of 25 universities besides that of Madras Christian College, which Kurian gave the lead to prepare. I wrote a paper entitled Hidden Curricula in the Teaching of Economics in Indian University with inputs from C.T. Kurian, John Robinson, Ken Raj, and Dudley Sears. If I initiated some syllabus reforms and experimented with new courses and wrote quite a few papers on the epistemological foundations or the discipline of economics, I must acknowledge I got the initial momentum from the writings and lectures of C.T. Kurian. Once much. I, I will conclude. Economic Robert Solow wrote problems inside the minds of 12 Nobel laureates in his book Economics for the Curious. The fundamental economics as a discipline is to bring organized to reason and systematic observation to bear on both large and small economic problems and to have some intellectual fun on the way for Korean from for Korean economics was not for the curious that certainly not for intellectual fun but to make sense of the world we live in and transform it for better life and well-being that precisely is the role of the social scientist which Korean has eminently delivered in his life Thank you very much. Happy Thank you. Birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm going to now ask uh, Professor P. Gurusami Babu, the uh, present director of uh, the Madras Institute of Development Studies, an expert in many things, but uh, a specialist in law and economics as well. Uh, Thank you, uh, Ram uh, and Madhra. Uh, first of all, let me uh, wish Professor Kurian a very happy 90th birthday. Uh, uh, Professor Kurian has been associated with the MIDS right from uh, the conception of the idea till date. And uh, during this half century, he downed the critical roles of the first director, then chairman, and now he is a life trustee of MIDS. Under his leadership, MIT has developed as one of the top national institutes for social science research in India and weathered many a storm. To capture the spirit of his academic personality, I'm just going to borrow a few episodes from his own memory. The first one is, uh, goes back to the period of 1971-72, uh, when the general elections brought Mrs. Gandhi to power at the center and Mr. M. Karnanidhi to the state. At the center, uh, if you all remember, Jagdish Bhagwati and uh, T. N. Srinivasan. Uh, Bhagwati and T. N. Srinivasan developed a model to show that accelerated growth and income transfer would reduce poverty. Mr. Karnanadi then set up a planning commission for the state uh, uh, with Professor Kurian in one of the key committees of the commission dealing with growth and poverty eradication. He says that he found that the main thrust of the committee was to produce a Mahalanobis like planning model for Tamil Nadu. I believe a Professor Kurian made it very clear that he had reservation about growth reducing poverty. 
As a counter, he wrote two of his well-known papers, uh, which Professor Amir Bakshi also alluded to, one entitled What is Growth? and the companion uh, paper, A Framework for the Eradication of Poverty in Tamil Nadu. The former argues that growth in the abstract without specifying its sectoral composition would not necessarily benefit the poor. In the later paper, he arrived at the disaggregated profile of the poor in the state with very meager data available at that particular point. Almost half a century later, we are still asking the same kind of questions about growth theory and data quality as well as availability. The second one is essential to understand perceptions about his research orientation and based on what I heard from him firsthand. Conversation uh, turned towards the public perception of the work of MIDS as well as that of Professor Kurian uh, that it had a leftist slant. He categorically summed up his own position to me as follows. Take up a real life issue and use any theory that will help you to analyze, uh, analyze that particular issue and throw light on it. It is worth reiterating Professor Kurian's impartial advice to young scholars of today. Among his many new initiatives at MIDS, I wish to highlight his idea of starting a referee half yearly research journal, Review of Development and Change, with a distinguished editorial advisory board. The motto of the journal was then and still is committed to examining the diverse aspects of the changes taking place in our society, aiming to encourage scholarship that perceives problems of development and social change in depth, document them with care, interpret them with rigor and communicate the findings in a way that is acceptable to readers from different backgrounds. RDC is now published by Sage for MIDS, is part of the UGC care list, a member of uh, CO, and pretty much continues in the same tradition as laid down by Professor Kurian. He has been a passionate thinker and prolific writer, as several of them, uh, several of the speakers before me pointed out, he wrote uh, almost around 15 books, and uh, if you thought his book, Wealth and Ilfair, uh, published in 2012 when he was 80, is testimony to his passion and commitment towards research, think again about uh, economics of real life, a new exposition, which he brought out in 2018. Uh, Professor Kurian wrote on a different occasion that one way of looking at special occasions such as this is to think of a photograph of all the people who were there at any time and of a collection of all such photographs over time from its inception. I am thankful to Madhura and VK Ramachandran for providing all of us such a collection today. On behalf of the extended MIDS community, I wish you a very happy and memorable 90th birthday, Professor Kuria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Babu. Thank you very much. We're now going to have three young people who did not actually work uh, directly with CTK, but uh, who's who CTK greatly influenced in the course of their, who CTK's work, who are greatly influenced by CTK's work and by his writing. We, uh, this is Dr. Gopinath, uh, we have Nelson from, and we have Dr. Professor Surjit from the National Institute of Rural Development. I'm going to start with Professor Surjit, who's at the National Institute of Rural Development, who uh, resurveyed one of the Slater villages, Palakurchi. In fact, he was in a long line after the, it was first later than uh, then Thomas and, Dad, uh, and Ramakrishnan, then uh, Margaret Haswell, then Guhan. And in the early 2000s, uh, Surjit surveyed the village. I know at that time he read the work of CTK before going to the village. And uh, he has actually, he is now leading a team which has resurveyed the village in 2020 as well. So, Surjit, you have five. Uh, first of all, a very warm, uh, um, happy 90th birthday to Professor Kurian. Uh, although I, unfortunately, I did not have any opportunity to meet you or listen to you before. Uh, uh, very happy to uh, see you on screen. Uh, let me start, begin with uh, uh, thanking Affairs for organizing this event uh, and giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm actually uh, a student of uh, uh, Professor Ramchandran and mother at ISA Kolkata. So I'm like a grand student of uh, uh, Professor Kurian. So uh, I, uh, as uh, Vikya was telling, uh, we, uh, my PhD work was on farm incomes and I was 
doing a village study of the Slater village. And that's that occasion where I have come across your work on uh, dynamics of uh, rural transformation. And uh, let me cite two important conclusions from that. Uh, 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 because we were following across uh, between the studies on uh, the Slater village, Palakurichi. Uh, what were the major changes that has happened in the village over a century? And uh, the two major conclusions from your study on, uh, on transformation in Tamil Nadu is worth mentioning now. The first conclusion is growth without rural transformation. And the second one is returns help farmers to survive, but large farmers to accumulate and the gap is increasing. So when we look at all the studies that had happened over uh, you know, uh, six points of time, uh, a two decades interval in that village, uh, your conclusions still, still help us in analyzing these changes. And these observations from these studies based on long-term changes largely aligned with these conclusions. The only difference would be the transformation is slowly happening, but to whose benefit is a big question which you have raised in several of your writings. Uh, the second thing which I want to uh, briefly mention about uh, uh, what Gilbert Slater has written in Indian Economic Journal at that time about the motive behind uh, sending his students to uh, study different villages in different part of Madras presence at that time. So uh, he was basically writing that uh, uh, I'm sending the students to understand and learn from rural India and its issues. And he clearly mentions about a disconnect between what is taught as economics and what is happening around in the countryside. So he wants the students to understand uh, the rural reality and link that with what, what is being learned from the economics textbooks. Uh, over years later, uh, uh, I, I feel and I think uh, Professor Kurian's efforts reflected in his work ranging from the dynamics of rural transformation to wealth and ill-fare, ill -fare, to economics of real life and new exposition, and his influence on his students reflected in their work as well is an effort similar to what Slater was trying to carry out through his students in 1916, almost a century back. In two aspects, one is to link the discipline of economics to real life problems, understand and study rural realities and issues and use methods of economic analysis to find long-standing solutions for that. And second, by infusing the spirit of growth with justice into the economic analysis, which all of your previous students were, were mentioning about. And uh, I wish Professor Kurian a very healthy, happy and productive years ahead and request him to can a younger generation of scholars in their efforts to build a just and equitable world through the discipline of economics. Thank you very much, Professor Kurian, and thank you, Affairs, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suji. Thank you. I'm going to now ask uh, uh, Dr. Gopinath, who, uh, who is at the MSSRF, uh, at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation to speak about uh, the influence of CTK on his work. Uh, Gopinath's work was based in Tanjavur district, like uh, Sujit. Thank you, sir. Uh, I thank uh, FAS for providing me with this opportunity to thank Professor CT Korean for providing a student like me with an analytical framework with his seminal work, this Dynamics of Rural Transformation, a study of Tamil Nadu from 1950 to 75. The book was introduced to me by my professor, Venkata uh, Shataya, in the very first class of my young field course. Uh, for a student like me from a farming background and being part of the transformation process in a rural area from where I came, it was a revelation to understand the causative factors that were happening. As students of economics, the book helped us not only in terms of understanding the process of transformation, but also on how to use published data and interpret results. So I would like to elaborate a few points from the book which have continued to guide my understanding and which I have used as a part of my continuing research work. 
Uh, Professor Korean's emphasis on a multidimensional approach for understanding the rural economy provided to be an essential guiding factor whenever studies on any aspect of rural community was taken. Often we visualize and see the changes around us, but after having read the book, it helped us perceive these changes differently. So personally, it helped me to understand the changes that, take, that took place in two ecologically different villages in Trichy region over a 25 year period. As part of a deeper analysis during my PhD work, I was able to see how the differential benefits to certain groups in these villages created a situation of increasing inequalities in the two villages and also document a case wherein a few groups were able to accumulate higher gains during the same period. So I take this special occasion as an opportunity to thank you, Professor, uh, professor for providing such a great, insightful, and scholarly work that guided me and many students like me. Wish you have a very happy birthday, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gopinath. We now have uh, S. Nelson Mandela, who was uh, who is still doing his PhD at the Hyderabad University, University of Hyderabad, and is working at the Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Thank you very much, Gopinath. Yeah. Let's send you get, uh, yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ram, and the Foundation for Agrarian Studies for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, Professor Korean has this amazing ability to present a complex economic ideas concept in a simple and lucid manner. Uh, the paper by Professor Korean titled uh, The Market Economy Theory and Ideolo Theory, Ideology and Reality is a good example. Uh, in this paper, with an easy to grasp fruit vendor example, he shows an instance where a supply curve can be downward sloping. You know, we all must have been in a situation, uh, in, in situations where a, a fruit vendor is ready to offer lower price per unit if you're willing to buy large quantities. And this is a situation where we have a downward sloping demand curve as well as a downward sloping uh, supply curve. And that's a problem. Uh, for the demand and supply curve to work, the neoclassical uh, economics simply assumes uh, that the suppliers are producers and all the buyers are consumers. But by this assumption, in, uh, in, in one stroke, it whitewashes uh, the presence of various levels of intermediaries in the market. And uh, in the current example, the fruit vendor, the merchant is, is not in the scene. And, and uh, these intermediaries are crucial for the functioning of markets in the real world. And uh, I mean, Professor Korea's ability to convey such complex economic ideas using such simple, uh, relatable example is uh, fascinating. Um, another point I would like to make is that, um, I mean, analysis at various levels of disaggregation is essential to develop a much uh, richer and holistic understanding of the Indian economy. Uh, during the late 70s, uh, we had important studies that discussed economic development and transformation at the nation level. Also, we had very insightful studies at the village level. And uh, some of the doyens of village studies are part of our discussion today as well. Uh, uh, however, uh, the, the studies that investigate the dynamics of transformation at the state regional level were limited. Uh, in that sense, the work by Professor Korean, uh, Dynamics of Rural Transformation, a study of Tamil Nadu is pioneering. Um, I've learned a great deal from the works of Professor uh, Siti Korean, and I'm sure uh, his work will continue to inspire many more uh, generation of scholars. Uh, happy birthday, Professor Korean, and thank you. Thanks very much, Nelson. I'm going to now go to two of his students, uh, to CTK's uh, uh, students at MCC. The first is going to tell us about uh, downward sloping supply curves, right, Bolu? Uh, Mr. E. Raghu Kumar, who, uh, who is, joins us from uh, London, and who is a uh, who has a, a, com a company, Mesida, uh, in uh, in uh, in London, here, <laughs> and uh, he, one of CTK's. Uh, CTK is he one of your favorite students? Does he count as a? <laughs> as one of, yeah, yeah, one of CTK's favorite. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Ram, Dr. Korean, Mrs. Korean. Prema, Priya, and your families, friends. Prakash, Ram, and I defy a cross-section of Dr. Korean students. The brilliant charismatic leader, uh, the brilliant economic advisor, and I who made up the numbers 
and who discovered the true meaning of Dr. Kurin's teachings when my work in, uh, began in Francophone and Lucifone Africa in 1982. Over 39 years, Dr. Kurin's book, Property Planning and Social Transformation, first published in 1979, in 78, I think, uh, became my book of reference, my Bible, easy to refer to and easy to carry. Dr. Kurind is an exceptional teacher who takes teaching very seriously. I shall never forget taking Dr. and Mrs. Kurind to visit Karl Marx's tomb at Highway. I'd lived in London for over 30 years and was full of enthusiasm to show my old teacher a monument he had wanted to visit all his life. We went to the cemetery and I could not find the tomb. We separated and Dr. Kurian found it. He called out to me. I was deeply apologetic and to reassure me, he said, Bolu, I'm happy that even after so many years, I'm still helping you to discover things. Dr. Kurian has this unique ability to impart his profound knowledge clearly and precisely without complicating the narrative with complex models and confusing jargon. Compare that to those of the executives of the international institutions working in Africa with my work, who often sound like snake oil salesmen with heavy doses of business models embroidered with copious uh, quantities of jargon and cliches, which have scant relevance to the specific natures of the problems confronting the poor in each country, each country different from the other. The real people affected by the policies of the international institutions are still suffering from the effect of colonization and it's different from the others. They hardly language, the uh, hardly understand the language, but only suffer some of the consequences. I recall on a very hot night in Mali in 1989, I'd arrived separately from the same flight as a group of World Bank and IMF executives and stepped out from the arrival hall to the uh, airport. I heard one taxi driver say to the other, Musa, wake up, wake up. They've arrived, the merchants of charity. The President Woods institutions have betrayed the tenets of the charter under which they were conceived. I recall the project manager of the International Finance Corporation ending a leg the legitimate arguments of the promoters of a cashew project in Mozambique in 1966, who were keen to secure IFC finance by saying he was import imposing the golden rule. When asked the meaning of the golden rule, he responded, he who has the gold makes the rules. I immediately drew his attention to the contradiction in the statement. In fact, it is the African countries with the actual gold and wealth, the minerals, the metals, and the oil, and they have gold, and curiously, they are in debt. I did offer to lend him my copy of Dr. Korean's book as an introduction to the concept of poverty. Needless to say, it was refused. And it was, it was the last IFC consultancy contract Bolu. that was offered. Bolu. So to uh, conclude, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, Christian College was a universe where some professors and students took on the role of stars. They drew us towards them like gravitational pull, our own positions, our own sense of who we ourselves are, our sense of purpose was determined in large part by their charisma, wisdom, and strength. Some shone brighter than most, and Dr. Korean was the brightest of them all. Speaking in honor of Dr. Korean's 90th birthday, I recall the words of Seneca often cited, as in a tale, such is life. Not how long it is, but how good it is. And goodness of Dr. Korean's life is beyond measure. Happy birthday, sir. Thanks, Bolo. Thank you very much, uh, Rebu Kumar. Now I'm going to ask the other student who is here. Prakash, don't, don't switch off the camera, Prakash. Put it on. Yeah. Prakash, keep your camera on. Yeah. I'm going to ask Prakash Kadak, member of the Politburo of the Communist Party of India Marxist, to speak. Yes, Prakash. Yeah, you're, you're, you're muted, Prakash. You're muted. Yeah, now you're on. I'm delighted to be here amongst all of you, friends, colleagues, students, and family members and admirers of Professor Siti Kurian on his turning 90 today. 
this is a special occasion indeed for the nine decades life of a man who's a scholar, a teacher, and a Christian humanist who has been committed to the cause of abolishing poverty and fighting for social and economic justice. I must be one of the oldest students of Dr. Kurian here, at least among the speakers. I joined the Madras Christian College for the BA economics course in 1965. It was by coincidence that I joined the economics course because I wanted to escape going to the engineering college to study engineering. The economics and social science curriculum in the Madras University in those days uh, was rather backward. But for us in MCC, studying economics, the bright spot was the classes we used to take with Dr. C.T. Kurian. And it would not be an exaggeration to say that whatever little economics of relevance that I learned was because of CTK. He widened my horizons and I recall that he was the first person to tell me to read Baran and Sweezy's Monopoly Capital. And I, when I look back, C.T. Kurian with his contributions and his intellect helped me in my evolution to become a Marxist. After I left college, I did not pursue economics, but I continued to read CTK's writings off and on. And as many speakers have pointed out, about CTK's contributions as an economist and a teacher. I would also like to say that we have seen how throughout his academic career and his teaching career, he has been able to inspire generations of teach, uh, students and given them a sense of direction and purpose in their calling as economists when they came, became econ economists in later life. I I to my regret, I lost touch with CTK for a spell of time, particularly in the 1990s. But then I could get in touch with him again. And I used to meet him after his retirement from the MIDS at his home in uh, Chennai in Adya, and later when he shifted to Bangalore. And of course, now that he's now living in uh, Kerala. For me, CTK's work, his economics, he has been a consistent uh, critic of neoliberal economics. He has shown us how high growth is not what is all that matters. High growth, which does not lead to reduction of poverty. High growth, which leads to heightened inequalities. And he has been, in his last two books, uh, wealth and ill fare and economics <clears throat> of a real life, given his vision and experience in a distilled form. Today, in the times that we are living, where 
rampant neoliberalism has created wreaked havoc with the lives of the working people and which has led to obscene inequalities. Today in the world we are living where religious and ethnic nationalisms and authoritarianism has attacked or suppressed democracy and equality in many spheres of life. And today in the pandemic life, the pandemic times that we are living in, when social and economic conditions have got exacerbated for the people, we, we need the sane and voice of reason of uh, CTK. And I'm glad that even now CTK is active. He leads an active life of the mind intellectually. He contributes. And when I met him before the pandemic at his new home in Arnakulam, I was happy to see how he and his Mrs. Kurian have settled down well there. I was looking forward to meeting them more often. But now on this occasion, when all of us have been able to come together, I would like to wish Dr. Kurian a very happy birthday and many, many more years of happiness and contentment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prakash. Thank you. We're now going to go to, uh, to the MIDS, MIDS years and to CTK's many colleagues at MIDS, visitors and uh, visitors and faculty and those who worked with him at that period. I'm going to ask, to begin, I'm going to ask Barbara Harris. Barbara, I can't see you. Barbara? Can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you now. I can see you now. Thank Barbara you. Harris, who came to, uh, who uh, joined MIDS in, um, must be 1977, was it? Oh, sorry, 78, 79, 78, 79, Barbara. And, uh, and is now a Meritus Professor at Oxford University. Barbara. Thank you very much, Ram. First and foremost, I want to say hello to everybody and to wish CTK a very, very happy opening of your 10th decade. And I want to thank the Foundation for Agrarian Studies for organizing this wonderful party. Um, one evening with Professor Kurian and uh, Mrs. Kurian, I was having an evening conversation after an extremely good meal cooked by Mrs. Kurian. And the light above Professor Kurian's head started to swing like a pendulum. Um, this was an earthquake. And so far, it is my only earthquake. Um, but I, in my five minutes, I would like to thank CTK for two other kinds of earthquake, metaphorically. Um, one is to do with the MIDS that we arrived in, in 1979. And the second earthquake, metaphorical earthquake, is to do with the contribution that he made to the study of Tamil Nadu as a region. So first, MIDS in 1979. It had been set up by Malcolm and Elizabeth Adisheshia. And if we go back to the founding documents, you see a lot of um, references to the study of micro development, to the study of Tamil Nadu, but also of India, to yeah, development, yeah. development dialogues uh, at various scales, and to the importance of the record to documentation and publication and to the library. Um, and so one of the first earthquakes was the excitement of being in MIDS, being made to feel very welcome right at the start when CTK took over. And when he recruited some people who were at this event, a, a really stellar cohort of young scholars. At the same time, Malcolm Adisesia didn't disappear, but he was busy in the background with his amazing bulletin and with a series of books on Tamil Nadu. And Siti Kurian wrote the fourth book, which was a guide to research in economics, which has proved to be very, very useful and has stood the test of time. 
but looking at the list of books that were published at the start of MIDS, there were, there were books on dry agriculture, on irrigation, on land reform, on fisheries, on labor and wages, um, and another set of books in a different dimension about human development, women, gender relations, nutrition, housing, education, and books on Dalits and tribals. So CTK um, added a great deal to that book series, um, which it didn't really aspire to. Um, with Joseph James, he produced this book. Can you see it? Yep. Economic Change in Tamil Nadu. I have an autographed copy. Um, the book is innovative and integrated. Um, it emerges from a critique of orthodox economics. It's a regional economics, and it's an experiment with a vast range of methods. For CTK, in this book and in subsequent books, time and space and society are all unique, and in neoclassical economics, that doesn't hold at all. Um, time is unique, and the book traces very fast change where industry and services are really on the move. Um, space is unique, it's, spe it's specific. And in the book, there is the most amazing classification of regions, right down to taluk level. And the reader has to get their mind around the fact that the regions are clustered, they're similar, but they're not necessarily adjacent to each other in space. This is quite a mind-bending exercise. And society is heterogeneous, not maybe in a modes of production way. The caste list is very varied, Peasants and agrarian elites, traders are there, big capital and the state. Um, and the book is very complex because reality is complex. And what CTK has is a capacity to go into the detail, but then also to move away from the detail and summarize it, which is terribly helpful. Um, the book traces the diversification of agriculture and at the same time, the rise of high yielding varieties of rice. Um, it, yes, I've got to finish. Non-farm economy, industrial concentration, and the state, the state captured by property interests um, and disadvantaging agricultural labor, which was growing. Okay, my final point is that the book traces the change in Tamil Nadu between 1960 and 1970, that's 50 years ago, it's exploratory, but it's really time that it was redone because the Dravidian model, which has just come out, doesn't quite do that. And the two time periods should be compared. Anyway, I, will, I want to hope that CTK goes on inspiring everybody who's dissatisfied with neoclassical economics, everybody who's brave enough to be heterodox and original in ways which are reasoned and um, everybody who's interested in an open-minded way in how the economy actually works. Thank you very much, CTK. Thank you very much, Barbara. And uh, with the, the first full-time faculty member of MIDS was, I believe, uh, he was recruited as a research associate. Right, Nagaraj? Hmm? It's, uh, K. Nagaraj? who came to MIDS from, from the Indian Statistical Institute in 1979. Nagaraj. Yeah, yeah. I got to know Professor City Korean when I joined MIDS in 1979. I had earlier heard of him as a, an exemplary teacher at the Madras Christian College. Uh, and uh, I stayed put in MIDS for the next 30 years till I retired from MITS, and that is all my working life. And uh, so I shall basically say a few words about uh, my experience in MITS. I will not touch upon his work because many of you have uh, talked about it. I will just touch upon it right at the end. And uh, I think uh, Professor CTK, along with uh, Professor Malcolm Adishishia laid the groundwork and basis for uh, MIDS and shaped it 
as a remarkable research institution. When I joined MIDS in 1979, it was still in its formative years. Uh, Professor CTK was the only senior faculty at that time. And, uh, but shortly afterwards, he brought in a number of youngsters. Many of us hadn't even finished our PhD by then. But we were all given complete freedom to work on whatever we, we were interested in. So uh, we worked on whatever we wanted to. We uh, had our own perspective. Uh, we had our own methodology. And uh, uh, it was a completely open, free atmosphere. And uh, some of the seniors who joined later did not and could not dictate what we should work on and uh, how we should do it. It was not, and it has never been, I think, a top heavy institution. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, there was no guidance. In fact, uh, rather than mold us through dictates and rules, I think what Professor Purian tried to do was set an example you know, a very simple lifestyle, very highly disciplined, okay, and uh, with the exemplary work ethic, uh, with uh, total commitment, total commitment to the institution, total commitment to progressive, pro-poor uh, ideas, and uh, yes, you know, some of us youngsters, at least me, <laughs> tried emulating him every now and then, but then sooner or later facts of life would intervene and we would relapse into our old ways. Uh, but there was always this, some sort of avuncular indulgence, in fact, you know. Uh, for a short while, okay, we could proceed like this, but uh, uh, later on there would be something like a slight nudge or a suggestion. Uh, he would call me and tell me, Nagarat, there is this proposal from the ILO to work on this particular topic. Why won't you take it up? Or he would say, you worked uh, enough on agriculture. Uh, why won't you try for rural economy? Why won't you try urbanization? These types of suggestions. Okay. Uh, I also think he tried to set an example through his academic and research work his commitment to a particular viewpoint, which is progressive and pro-poor, as I told you, uh, and uh, the type and quality of work. I shall come back to it right at the end for a few minutes. Yes? Uh, you said you'll come back to it right at the end. You should be at the end right now. OK. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, but before that, I would like to point out that there was certain other characteristics of the institution which he, uh, which he tried to shape. One was it was never an ivory tower, and second was uh, he uh, uh, it uh, it had while it had a broad liberal left orientation. Within that, he also tried to bring in different disciplines, uh, different perspectives. Uh, so, uh, uh, it had a diversity through which I think we all learned a great deal. Uh, and uh, coming back to his academic work, I, I will just take a couple of minutes on that. Uh, I shall basically illustrate what it meant to me uh, in terms of, uh, say, saying a few words on uh, the dynamics of rural transformation. Uh, which I admire a great deal. It came out in 1981. Uh, the first thing that struck me about the work was it was based almost completely on secondary data. Uh, and it was a simple imaginative statistical analysis of that. It was a concrete analysis of a concrete situation with a perspective, uh, with a proper perspective uh, and uh, uh, and it, in fact, 
uh, illustrated, I think, the whole phenomenon of peasant differentiation and its underpinning and consequences in Tamil Nadu. Uh, and as it was pointed out, there is one last point that is uh, an important quality of CTK's academic output, uh, including, of course, the dynamics. In the way he writes, uh, it's extremely simply written, it's coherent, logically structured, and uh, it has an easy flow. Uh, any student can read it and follow, uh, follow it. It's eminently educative. In that sense, I think CTK has remained you all through his life, quint a quintessential teacher. Okay, and uh, uh, yeah. I have had a wonderful time at the uh, MIDS. My, you know, my career was spent there. I learned a lot. Uh, so I should thank Professor Kurian for all that. Uh, I would also, uh, I would also congratulate him on his birth, 90th birthday. Uh, and wish him many more years of productive and uh, productive life in educating all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nagaraj. Thank you. Thank you very much. When uh, MIDS started in 78, 79, in the beginning there was uh, there were three. There was uh, there was uh, CTK. I mean, this is when it became a, a national institute. There's CTK, there's Bharatan, and there's John Harris, right? Uh, Barbara came. Barbara, you did you come a little late? I think. Huh? But uh, so John Harris was there very early. John, thanks so much, uh, uh, and uh, thank you, Ram. Thank you, the foundation, for, uh, for starting this, this uh, setting up this great occasion. Um, and you know, like others, I, I'll just begin, if I may, with a little bit of reminiscence. Because though uh, CTK, uh, Barbara and I first met you actually in 1974, um, which I think was when you were just starting your work uh, with, uh, with Joe James on the book that, uh, that Barbara uh, has referred to. It, it was in the summer of 1978, as Ram has said, uh, that I really uh, got to know you. Uh, when I came to MIDS as a visitor, very shortly after, you had taken over as director of the new, uh, we can think of it, the sort of the new uh, MIDS. And I think that uh, the staff of MIDS at that time was just you and a young research officer, I think, called Baradhan. And so I added very significantly, in a sense, uh, to the faculty strength uh, as, a, as a visitor. How different it was uh, just a year later when Barbara and I came back, uh, when you had recruited so many uh, wonderful, dynamic young scholars and uh, young, uh, young researchers uh, to, uh, to MIDS. But for me, the summer of 1978 was the beginning of what has been a, a long association uh, that's meant a great deal to me through, uh, through my life and for which I'm very grateful. Uh, and I'm really very happy indeed to be able to, to greet you uh, on this wonderful occasion of your uh, 90th uh, birthday. Like others, I, I'm going to just talk a little bit uh, about the dynamics of rural transformation uh, in, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, um, which was the, the product of research that you carried on. Uh, in the later 1970s. At that time, a good many of us uh, were engaged in fieldwork-based studies of agrarian change uh, in Tamil Nadu. Venkatesh was just starting work, I think, with Joran Jörfeldt and the late Stefan Lindberg. Uh, Ram, I think, was already working in the Gokelapuram. And MIDS, of course, under Guhan's leadership, was very shortly going to start uh, the restudy of the, uh, of the Slater villages. But as Nagaraj just said, you showed what it was possible to learn about rural transformation by bringing together and then uh, in your characteristic way, uh, analyzing meticulously uh, secondary data available from such sources as the census, NSS reports, 
uh, RBI in rural investment and debt surveys, season and crop reports, uh, and, uh, and so on. And I think it's important to note that the dynamics of rural transformation um, actually inspired scholars in other parts of the country to do for their states what you had done for, for Tamil Nadu. Uh, and I think together these studies made, if I may say so, for a very useful corrective to the kind of high flown uh, theorizing of a lot of the celebrated or perhaps we should say infamous mode of production debate uh, of the time about which we had some very fierce debates uh, in MIDS in, uh, in 1980, as I recall. You showed that in Tamil Nadu in the period from 1950 to 75, there'd been a good deal of dynamism uh, in the agricultural economy, but strong growth in agricultural productivity hadn't improved rural living standards and the incidence of rural poverty uh, in 1975 wasn't really far off what it had been uh, in 1950. Growth had come about, you argued, without structural transformation. As you showed, there had been significant sectoral change and agriculture in 1975 no longer made up anything like as large a share of NSDP as it had done. But over the same period, the data on the labor force difficult though it was to interpret because of definitional changes, seemed to show that employment in agriculture had actually increased. While there'd not been much change in land ownership, redistributive land reform had evidently achieved very little, there was strong evidence of increasing concentration of asset ownership uh, in the rural economy. You traced the greatly increased importance of groundwater irrigation, and the relative success of HIV cultivation. But an observation of yours about this seems very striking to me, read 40 years later, as I did just yesterday. You said that a longer run perspective on paddy production in the state really belied the idea of green revolution. Post HIV, post high yielding variety growth rates in productivity were actually lower, you found, than those that had been achieved in the 1950s. And you observed presciently both that the Green Revolution, so-called, uh, was heavily dependent uh, on uh, state subsidies, but very important, I think, think of it, thinking of this written in 79, 1980, the Green Revolution, uh, you said, uh, was already showing signs uh, of weariness. Large farmers, of course, were the major beneficiaries, and even though small farmers uh, were more efficient, you showed, very many of them were only just surviving. They were as poor, evidently, as were agricultural labourers who'd seen their real wages decline. John, we're getting under time. Got just a minute and a half, Ram. A quiet transformation was taking place, you said. The tendency of small farmers to leave the land and farming and to join the ranks of the rural proletariat. A compelling analysis. I think I and others who were undertaking field studies felt challenged. What did our work suggest that either qualified or added to your findings? I sought to argue on the basis of the second round of the North Arcot studies that though proletarianization was certainly taking place, it was probably happening without depeasantization. And I remember you gently uh, sort of twitting me for generalizing too much from uh, you know, a, a small number of, uh, of, of village studies. But this is the, just the point that I sort of want to, to make finally. With the advantage now of hindsight, I think we can see that what was actually missed in the sources on which uh, your analysis drew was the extent already of pluriactivity in the, in the rural economy. The fact that people depend uh, on uh, several uh, different activities, so that the description, for example, agricultural laborer that appeared in so many of the statistical sources concealed a much more complex uh, mode of, uh, of gaining a livelihood. What the sources may also have missed was the importance already 
of the extensive labor circulation uh, that was becoming uh, and has since become so much of a feature of the Tamil Nadu rural economy. But to suggest, as I am, that there were some aspects of rural transformation that your, uh, your analysis missed. We, we must no uh, way to, we, we to must detract have. from its great significance uh, at, at that time, 40 years ago. For that and so much else, thank you, CTK, and a very happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, our eminent colleague and CTK's uh, long-time co colleague and uh, interlocutor, uh, Dr. Venkatesh Atreya, Professor Atreya. Ah. You can switch on the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm just delighted to be here. I, mean, I just want to express the joy of the occasion first. We can talk about debates. John has thrown the gauntlet about modes of production. I'm not going to pick him up on that. But it's just a sheer delight to be here. And Professor Kulishan has meant so much to us. So many of us in so many ways, not just as an academic, but a human being. I mean, for me, I, I put it very simply. CTK has grown on me over the years. Simply grown on me. I mean, I, you know, I knew him very little in the late 70s. I was a very irreverent young man writing reviews that came to my head. And of course, he very gently made a reference to it many years later. But you know, as you watch CTK's writing and research and work and his commitment to sustained intellectual activity and to sustain involvement in social issues. He was no, he was no armchair academic. He was there uh, behind us in many of the progressive interventions that we sought to develop in Tamil Nadu, or whether it is on communal harmony or on uh, working people's rights and so on. But for me, this is a very joyous occasion to see Professor Korean, Mrs. Korean, and the family. So let me first say thanks, Ram, for making this possible. It's a very, very happy birthday, Professor Korean. You mean so much to me personally, and so much to all of us academically and personally. It's just a pleasure to be here. Uh, second, I used to prescribe to every student of mine dynamics of rural transformation. Even though you might have thought that I wrote a rather critical review of it, it was one of the longest reviews in social scientists. I don't think there's been a longer review after that. Uh, 1981 was your book, and I wrote my review in 1983. It took some time to study it and absorb it. But phenomenal. I mean, going back, looking at it now, I feel, uh, in a sense, I was repaying my debt to you when, in your felicitation volume, I actually wrote. Uh, an article that attempts to update the dynamics of rural transmission in Tamil Nadu from the time that you ended, 1780, and takes it to the uh, first decade of the 21st century. And uh, what that highlights, of course, is that there are distinct phases in the growth of agrarian capitalism, and the state plays a very central role. So the story after 1991, with the withdrawal of the state, is obviously very different from the story between uh, 19. 50 and 1991, when we were writing about it. So obviously the fact that you and I and others found some dynamism in rural agriculture, there's no surprise. What is interesting is that post-1991, much of the dynamism was uh, not available because of the nature of state policy, although growth continued to, to occur and so on. So I don't want to get into that whole debate, but I think, I think that you've done enough to make all of us think about these issues. And I'm looking forward to some more contributions from you. It's unfair, I know, but I know you can, and so you will be asked to. And I remember in particular how uh, my own assessment of you know the value contribution of your work changed when I read your later works. In a written in a very simple way, you have you know I had the privilege of going through a complete translation of uh, your book on uh, wealth and ill fare. This is a great education. Wherever I have taught in many business schools and university departments, I've always prescribed your Wealth and Hillfire for MBA students before they get into the corporate life. Likewise, your last most recent book. And earlier, I don't know many of you know this, he wrote a small uh, essay about how finance can be understood as another planet. A very useful article that I've used for my uh, MBA students. <laughs> Teacher par excellence, great attention to detail, great care in the choice of words, great sobriety in framing what you want to frame. These are qualities that you know, we have tried to learn from you. I don't think we have always succeeded, but over the years, I have at least uh, 
stop getting my shirt uh, you know locked into door knobs as you once advised me in bangalore way back in 81 to slow down and and so on you know it's been wonderful and i think uh, i look forward to more and more uh, inputs from you in the years to come we will continue to be inspired by you and by the whole family uh, such a pleasure and i'm not going to take my 5 minutes ram can thank you thank you very much don't worry about keeping the mic no all the we get it sure all the you, best you have used like you have used your 5 minutes wonderfully thank you okay uh, i'm going to now ask uh, mr dr jesudas athyal he is a um, colleague of of ctk and person who's worked with ctk he is a um, just give me a second he is a, a visiting researcher at the center for global christianity and he's been a colleague of ctk over the years uh dr jayadev uh, it's a great joy for me to be uh here and i would like to thank the foundation for agrarian studies and and dr vk ramachandran uh for organizing this event and for inviting me to be here and at the and at the outset i would like to wish um, uh, dr kurian happy birthday again i did speak to him this morning and uh, delivered my personal uh, greetings and uh, best wishes to him i was not fortunate to be uh, dr kurian student or colleague and my limited understanding of his work comes from the indian christian social thinkers like mm thomas nainan koshi paulo smart paulos and others who are influenced by his writings and this mutual and this mutual interaction in my reading was a forerunner in the christian marxist dialogue and interaction that emerged in india in subsequent decades and therefore that's what i would briefly focus on and i will try to conclude before my name is called and as india emerged from centuries of colonialism and was on a path of nation building the socially conscious and progressive sections among indian christians too wanted to be part of this process and therefore in independent india emerged institutions like cisr that's a christian institute for the study of religion and society based in bangalore csrs that provided a platform for the socially uh, concerned uh, indian scholars and that was what attracted young scholars like ct kurian to be a part of csrs but he urged the christian scholars to be not only focused on theological and philosophical issues but also take the social and economic process seriously and some of the uh, some of the uh, first books of dr kurian were published by csrs the book our five year plans that came out in 1966 exposed the planning process of india and another book of poverty and development published in 1976 was a more academic work that focused on the need for growth with justice by taking the ordinary people seriously in the planning process and a third book poverty planning and social transformation came out in 1978 and so a good number of his books in the early stages were published by the CISRS and these books contributed greatly to shattering the mainstream thinking on growth and development it was believed until then that when the economy grows all will benefit and that when the cake gets bigger all will get a better piece dr kurian's writings came as a bombshell shattering the optimism implied in this theory and he argued for a conscious and deliberate intervention on behalf on behalf of the ordinary people and he insisted that poverty should be at the center of all our discussions and secondly uh, i would like to argue that scholars like dr kurian prepared the ground for greater cooperation during the uh, subsequent decades between the progressive sections on the left and the people of faith particularly indian christians 
thanks to Dr. Kurian's pioneering work, a section of the progressive elements among both the communists and Christians were prepared to work with each other on areas of common interest. And especially in Kerala, there were a number of instances when the communists and the people of faith committed to the values of justice, freedom and secularism came together on a common platform. And one issue, uh, one issue of Marxist Samvadam, uh, published in 1993 with uh, uh, Comrade E.M.S. Nambodilpar as the editor, focused on the theme, the left and the minority religions in Kerala. And that book brought together several scholars like uh, M.M. Thomas, P. Govinda Pilla, Nainan uh, Koshi, and uh, Mr. Nambodilpar and the others. And another instance uh, that happened just a couple of years ago was the book Christ, Marx, and Srinarayana Guru, uh, published uh, just in uh, uh, 2018. Uh, Philippos Marcus Austin, the Metropolitan Emeritus of the Marthama Church, and Mr. Davy, Comrade M.A. Baby. Politburo member of the CPIM jointly worked on this book. So this book, uh, titled Christ, Marx, and uh, Srinarayana Guru, were jointly brought out by Comrade M.A. Baby and uh, 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 Bishop Philippos. So you'll have to wind, Dr. Athel, you'll have to wind yes, up. Yes, yeah. yes. And in this book, uh, uh, they share the criticism and concern of both um, um, uh, politicians and the people of faith and Mr. Sitaram Yechuri and the Chief Minister of Kerala, Pinarayi Vijayan, uh, uh, were the contributors to this book. And in conclusion, it may be pointed out that uh, like in most other parts of the world, in our country also, there's a long history of hostile relationship between the communists and the people of faith. But if today the progressive sections on both sides in India have found areas where they can come together, the pioneering work done by scholars like Dr. Siti Kurian played an important role in it. And Dr. Kurian's lasting contribution is his affirmation that the fundamental questions facing us today are not only about dogmas or creeds or manifestos, but the poverty of people in an unjust society the need for growth with justice and the commitment to uphold the values of secularism, human rights, and democracy. And today, therefore, we celebrate Thank the you. life of a pioneer and a visionary, and we wish him all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last on our list is uh, someone also who, came, who was associated with the MIDS uh, early in her uh, academic career, Madhuriya Swaminathan. You're going to. Please, uh, so I, I met uh, CTK in 1984 uh, when I came to work on a research project in uh, Madhuri. The, the sound is not good enough. If you could just hold the microphone up to your mouth, Madhuri, thank you. Uh, so I met CTK in 1984 at MIDS. And as all of you know, I got a very warm welcome and uh, I want to say that, you know, ever since then, uh, one of his, uh, I think, amazing um, qualities is that whenever you write to him or send an article or a book, you get a, you know, by return post, as it were, you get a reply, uh, which is not just an acknowledgement, uh, but a detailed, uh, you know, comment on the work and having that showing that he has read it. Uh, CTK, I think you don't know, but the date of our wedding was decided by you when you decided when Ram could submit his thesis. So you have uh, influenced our life in many ways. And thank you to both of you. Uh, I want to end by saying that as a teacher myself, uh, one of the things that uh, has been really helpful reading your work is that whatever the problem one is talking about, uh, what you have written goes to the core of the matter. I was looking at uh, the dynamics of rural transformation 
and you write there about how the 1% uh, control the assets that more than 90% together have, the lowest 90%. Uh, today, with the whole world is talking about inequality and 1%. And in your work, uh, early work, you were able to uh, you know, show us the way by crystallizing the essence uh, of the problem of inequality. Uh, another very amazing chapter uh, in your book on uh, Tamil Nadu again uh, was titled Decision Makers. And the way you put it, it's uh, almost uh, facile, the, uh, the assumption that all agents or all individuals behave the same way, whether it's maximizing something or minimizing something else. And that decision making itself depended on control over resources, you know, control over the environment. And uh, it was not just a matter of psychology and you know, how one uh, people behaved. And in your study uh, of macroeconomics, which went beyond looking at aggregates, looking at uh, measures in terms of value of SDP and sectoral decomposition, but looking at how classes fed. And I think that I speak for many of the young people listening in today in some of the work that we're doing with FAS, uh, trying to refine with more data uh, the kinds of classes in rural society and how the interests of different classes and the position of different classes uh, has changed. Uh, I won't go on, there's so much more to say uh, thank you to both of you, and over to you, Ram. CTK, I don't, uh, may I, uh, thank you, Madhira, thank you. CTK, may I ask you to uh, say a few words? Well, I am overwhelmed by what I have heard. And there were minutes when I wondered whether the speakers were speaking about somebody else rather than about me. Uh, I am indeed grateful to Ram and Madhura and the Foundation for uh, Agrarian Studies for organizing this session. Thank you very much indeed. I wish I had the time to uh, comment on what different people said, but I shall refrain from it. Uh, I turned to economics after coming to know about the widespread poverty in our country. You may be interested in knowing two books that influenced me to understand the extended nature of poverty in Tamil Nadu. One was Minu Masani's Our India. I don't know whether that book is familiar at all. And the second was Palm Dutch's India Today. Uh, yes. I remember going to the Indian economic class where V.K. Ramachandran was a student. He was, he had taken one of the back benches tests. And when I introduced myself saying that I am CT Korean and I'm going to be with you for the next three years, he sort of sat up like this. Uh, I was disappointed with teaching, not because of anything else, but what you were asked to teach was, may I use stronger language, rubbish. And I could not tolerate it for long. The only session that I used to enjoy was Indian economic problems. Because you know, you could abandon everything and then try to understand the nature of the Indian economy. Uh, students used to ask me, uh, will this help in the examination? I said, go and pick up any book on Indian economics, there are plenty of them. 
do what you like with them and the examination, but let's try to understand. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised too that uh, Dynamics of Rural Transformation was the book that has, seems to have influenced so many people, although I noticed that the younger generation have touched upon uh, wealth and welfare and economics of real life, both written in my 80s, the last one when I was 87 years old. Uh, but I think the time has come to say that uh, I don't think I will have the ability to write much more. I continue to be interested in reading what other people write to the extent that I can. And uh, I'm indeed grateful to you, all of you, for this session. And as I said earlier, I wish I had the time to talk about what each one of you had raised, but as the time is ended, let me say a big thank you, thank you to all of you. Happy birthday, Sam. May I? Uh, yeah. Now, um, yeah. happy birthday, City Gate. Yes. Once again. We've come to the end of this evening's program of tribute to City Gate. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, all participants. We wish we had more time, and we had, and we could hear many more people, many more of the people who come here this year. Such a so many, so many old friends and so many young people here. So before I end, dear and respected CTK, we wish you many more, many more years of active thinking, advice, reading, and writing. Thank, thank you, thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We conclude. We conclude this meeting. Thank you, everyone, Goodbye, for joining. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Gurian, for joining. Um, we will now end the session. Thank you. You can watch the recording of this uh, session on our could, you, uh, uh, could you make that announcement louder, uh, Neera? Could you announce that louder? Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Professor Kurian, especially. Uh, you can watch this recording on our See. YouTube channel at any time. That you it, it is available on the YouTube <laughs> channel. It's on the YouTube channel, isn't it? Hi, all. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, CDK. Bye. Bye.